This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, I would like to welcome everyone here um, at the American Numismatic Society this evening, whether you are in person or uh, joining us online. For the 2022 Sanford Saltus Award for Signal Achievement in the Art of a Medal, awarded this year to Hannah uh, Jelonek. The Saltus Medal Award was created in 1913 with a grant by J. Sanford Saltus to recognize and encourage excellence in the art of a medal. The first medal was awarded in 1919 to Janek E. Fraser and was presented solely to American medallic artists until 1983 when eligibility was expanded to include foreign artists. The silver medal was designed by A. A. Weinmann, one of the finest sculptures of the Beaux-Arts tradition. And the second winner of the award, um, and, the, oh, and he was the second uh, winner of the award. Hannah Jelonek will be the 60th recipient to be honored for her lifetime achievement in the medallic art. The Saltus Award Committee currently consists of Chairman Dr. Alan Stahl, here today, uh, Secretary Peter Van Alphen, here as well, NS President Otto Wattenberg, who is flying back from Greece as we speak, uh, National Sculpture Society Executive Director uh, Gwen Peer, who is uh, with us as well tonight, and uh, 2019 Saltus Awardee Mashiko, I can see uh, on the third row. Dr. Alan Stahl, who will um, introduce um, uh, the awardee um, uh, tonight, uh, will uh, present the award and is someone, well, is a renowned numismatist and historian, the author of about 10 books, correct? Not 11, 10. So 10 books, and, and I've been told over 100 uh, articles in ancient and modern coinage, medals and decorations. Since 2004, he has been the curator of numismatics at Princeton University, and for over two decades prior, he served as the curator of medieval coinage and medals here at the ANS. He has been a fellow of a society since 2021, having joined as a member in 1976. Uh, so soon, yeah, soon 50 years. Congratulations. Dr. Stahl received his PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania with speciali specialization in archaeology and art history. His dissertation became the basis of a book, The Merovingian Coinage of the Region of Metz. In, published in uh, 1982, research on which he began as a student in the ANS Summer Graduate Seminar. Later this evening, he will be providing the Stephen K. Scher Lecture entitled Medals by Committee, the History Numismatique of Louis XIV. Should I say history or history? Histoire. Histoire. Histoire, <laughs> then. Uh, in um, the original language. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Stahl and please uh, make sure your cell phones are in silence mode or no disturb or switch off or any mode that's not um, audible. Thank you. Hello. The American Numismatic Society is pleased to award the J. Sanford Saltus Award for Signal Achievement in the Art of the Medal to Polish sculptor Hanna Antonina Jalonek. A lifelong student of the art, Jalonek studied at the Faculty of Painting, Graphics, and Sculpture at the State High School of Fine Arts in Wrocław before completing her BA at the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. 
She graduated with honors in 1981 with a specialty in medallic art under the supervision of Professor Sofia Demkowska. In 1985 to 1986, she held a, fellow, a scholarship from the Italian government to continue her studies at the School of Medallic Art in Rome, receiving the commendation of the school council. Since 1990, she has held several positions at her alma mater, the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw, in the Department of Sculpture, beginning as an assistant in the studio of metals and small sculpture forms, run by Professor Piotr Gavron. In 1998, she received her PhD in fine art from the Academy Habilitated in 2005 and became a full professor in 2020. From 2012 to 2019, she served as Dean of the Faculty of Sculpture and since 2004 has been running the Medallic Art Workshop. Aside from her academic and educational accomplishments, Yelonik is a prolific sculptor and medallic artist and has participated in many exhibitions and national and international competitions. Her works are in the collections of, among others, the Metal Art Museum in Wrocław, the Copper Museum in Lenica, the Asia and Pacific Museum in Warsaw, and the British Museum. Her awards include, among many others, the 2018 British Art Metal Society's Struck Medal Award. The Saltis Award Committee has singled out Hanna Jelonek from a strong field of contemporary medalists for her ability to explore such modern techniques in medallic art as the use of negative space and multiple materials while at the same time showing herself a master of the classic elements of psychological portraiture and the expert use of letterings to complement sculptured images. And now we'll see a few examples of her work. And then once we've given her the medal, we will call upon her to make a few comments. She doesn't look very different today, does she? These are three-dimensional views of the last medal you saw.
So it is with great pleasure that on behalf of the American Numismatic Society and the J. Sanford Saltus Committee, I present the Saltus Award for Signal Achievement in the Art of the Medal for 2022 to Hannah Yelomek. Congratulations. <laughs> short speech. <laughs> Sorry for my English, but I'm very moved. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the American Numismatic Society, the Saltus Committee of the, the American Numismatic Society has nominated me as a recipient of prestigious distinction, the Sanford Saltus Medal Award. I'm extremely moved and feel honored to have become part of, a such, of such an outstanding fraternity of medallic artists. This silver medal, designed by Adolf Alexander Weinmann, is truly beautiful. I wish to thank you very much for this wonderful award. The January correspondence I received with information about the prize awarded to me came as a great surprise. My joy mixed with surprise and even disbelief, profound emotions were endless. Not least, surprised was my overworked computer, which <laughs> sent the first email to my spam folder. <laughs> But all is well that ends well. I am now here at the American Numismatic Society in New York among my dear friends, enthusiasts of medallic art to receive the most prestigious award for distinguished achievement in the field of the art of the medal. Thank you very much again. As you know, I'm the third artist from Poland to obtain the Soltus Medal Award. My Polish predecessors are all my dear friends and wonderful artists, Ewalszewska Boris and Paweł Wenski. However, in this special moment, let me also mention the name of a person whom Ewa, Paweł, myself and a large number of Polish medallic artists of their professional flourishing and their notable world success. I'm talking about Professor Zofia Demkowska, our maestro, who ran the Medallic Art Studio at the Faculty of Sculpture at the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw for many years. Yes, we are all her alumni. It is her school. The essence of sculpture and modern art is, is its confrontation with social space and its role in the exchange of ideas between generations and in the intercultural dialogue. The medal, which belongs to the area of sculpture, is particularly suited to this role not only as a medium confirming the richness of the past and referring the historical knowledge. The two sides of the medal make up a unique artistic medium useful for your own original stu students and statesmen. What is about the medal that captured my imagination so much? Professor Zofia Demkowska used the define medal to define medal and medallic art as the art of small relief. It is true. The area of few or several square centimeters, which a sculptor, sculptor, medallic artist has at his or her disposal, becomes a world apart. Because of the scale of a medal, each detail each detail, even the smallest intervention into its form is noticeable. It is thanks to its size, however, that a medal achieves a unique optics. 
It is a little bit like peeping at the world through a hole in the fence. It is not only interesting, but also most inspiring. Thank to, thanks to its exceptional canon of construction of space as a relief, whose two di dimensions, height and width, remained unchanged in their proportions, while the third dimension, depth, is reduced. The medallic artist is offered another chance. This compression is purely abstract and unique in its own way, which somehow forces the artist to look at the space differently, to understand and shape it anew. For me, a medallic artist, it is a never-ending adventure. It is difficult to stop testing over and over again both the formal and conceptual aspects. I have always been passionate about this artistic experiment, what I very much appreciate, regardless of the in-depth analysis of a selected subject and the amount of study put into it, in my final project, I always try to achieve the most synthetic form as the medallic form somehow imposes synthesis. In this respect, it is a constant search for new solution, a never ending artistic, exciting experiment. A medal is the only special form which has to be held in the hand and read. Although quite small in terms of the dimensions, it refers to the space of the spirit that is to the artist's imagination and sensitivity to draw upon what is uncovered and concealed on emotions, on the realms of individual experience and observation and also or perhaps mostly, it refers to the interest of sensitivity of the modern audience. I mentioned intercultural dialogue at the beginning. It would be hard indeed to find a better place in New York, where the paths of newcomers from all over the world have converged for centuries, where human stories meet where this extraordinary dialogue continues. Thank you very much for the Saltus Medal Award. I am grateful to be with you here in New York. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before turning the podium back over to Alan Stoll for the share lecture, um, I would like again to express uh, congratulations to Hannah for um, the award of uh, this very prestigious uh, Saltus Award to her. Um, I also would like to take a moment to express our gratitude to Dr. Stephen uh, K. Scher, whose uh, named lecture Alan will be delivering tonight. Um, Dr. Scher um, is a renowned collector of medallic art and is um, somebody who has published a great deal on his specialty of Renaissance medals particularly. And for many years, he was also chair of the Saltus Committee. And in fact, when I started uh, as secretary of the Saltus Committee, he was at the time uh, chairman. So um, on behalf of the ANS, um, I would like to again, just express our gratitude to him for everything that he has done for medallic art at the ANS including the share lecture. Um, Alan needs no introduction because Gilles did a wonderful job introducing him already. So I would like to invite him back to the podium to give the share lecture tonight, uh, Medals by Committee, the Histoire Medallique de, uh, of Louis XIV, or Louis XIV. So please, Alan. Okay, thank you. <laughs> While some medals are the result of the initiative of individual artists, many are made by commission and often based on a theme or design 
created by a committee. The medals of Louis XIV present an extreme case of such medallic creation. <clears throat> In 1660, Gaston, Duke of Orléans, bequeathed a large collection of ancient coins to his nephew, Louis XIV. And here we see the child Louis admiring some ancient coins. By all accounts, Louis had a passionate interest in these coins, and in 1684 made their housing a major feature of Versailles, as this former hunting lodge was being transformed into a grand palace. The home of the numismatic collection was to be the Cabinet des Médailles. Am I getting a... Yeah, there we are which it's called today in France, a room strategically placed for visits both by the king between chapel and bedtime. And we do have many accounts of him stopping in to look at the ancient coins on his way up to bed and for visitors making a grand tour of the palace. On the way, they would pass through the antechamber of the Cabinet de Médaille called the Salon de l'Abondance, so-called for its magnificent trompe-l'oeil ceiling with its mythological depictions of deities concerned with wealth, minting, and architecture. The few who were lucky enough to be invited into the inner sanctum holding the royal collections would progress through a rich door flanked by pa paintings and busts. Now, we can't go inside it as Louis would have because in 1750, it was converted to a billiard room and the collection ultimately was sent to the Bibliothèque Nationale, where it is today. We have, as a description, some written descriptions by contemporaries, and this drawing made by a Swedish visitor to reconstruct its interior. The original cabinets that house the collection, however, do survive, as do the inlays for the drawers that held the individual coins. And here, the sheets of illustrations and descriptions that describe the collection within the cabinet. And each coin is given a full description here under a view of both faces. The cabinet was under the direction of Jean Foivaillant who before the move had published a catalog of bronze coins of the Roman emperor. Such bronze coins, especially the large ones called Cistercii, were highly prized by Renaissance collectors and scholars, many of whom believed they were not monetary and con constituted a Historia Augusta, a medallic history of the reign of an emperor. And Probably the main feature in the first two centuries of numismatic scholarship is the fight between people who thought these were coins and people who thought they were too big and too beautiful to be coins and were actually something akin to what we would call a medal, a commemorative piece that had no monetary faction, function. <clears throat> this concept of the medal as the glorification of a ruler was taken up by some Renaissance rulers who sought to convey the high points of their reigns by having bronze medals struck of about the same size and format as Roman coins. So we're getting away from the big cast Pisanello medals to ones that really look like Roman coins in many ways.
French medals of the early modern period, on the other hand, were usually cast and significantly larger than the Cisterciers, though following in many cases their general format. So you see this is 67 millimeters, whereas the Cisterciers is around 40. So there's no confusion, and of course we've even got the hanger cast into it. The early medals of the reign of Louis XIV followed the format of those of his predecessors, cast, and again, with a hanger, and relatively large. Technical innovations, such as the screw press, allowed the French mint of the 17th century to actually strike large metals, whereas up till that period, it had only been possible to cast metals of over 45 millimeters in diameter. So here we can compare the cast version of this medal of Louis and his mother, the regent, uh, and the struck version in the same size. Later medals of the reign continue to be struck in large sizes while still carrying forth the format of the Roman Cistercius with king or monarch with, uh, oops, with uh, identifying legend around the obverse, the reverse, some saying in Latin, usually not in the form of a sentence. It's very rare to get a verb in these things. They're all adjectives and participles. Uh, and then in the excerpt below the line here, uh, the date often and the artist. Jean-Baptiste Colbert, Louis' first minister of state, worked on many fronts to systematize the reign of Louis XIV into a multimedia promotion of his glory. One of these was to create a small academy or Petite Academie in 1663, which was small by reference to the larger Académie Française, which had been created three decades earlier, basically to define the French language by the elaboration of a dictionary. The small academy, on the other hand, was charged with the production of a history of the reign by the creation of a uniform series of medals along the lines of those imperial histories that the Roman emperors had created, which, of course, they didn't, but this was what they were striving for. The members of the committee were highly respected literary figures, but at first had the committee had no one with a background either in ancient coins or in the creation of metals. You see uh, Charles Perrault, who's known to us as the author of fairy tales, a poet, uh, an abbot, but of course anyone could be an abbot if they were given the money that went with it. And uh, this body was soon renamed the Academy of Medals, and eventually its meetings were moved to Versailles. They had actually started in the palace, the, the personal home of Colbert. And then they were transferred to the Louvre, and then finally to Versailles. Charles Perrault, uh, who had been disgraced for statements considered anti-royal in the so-called battle between the ancients and the moderns, were remo was removed from the committee. The battle between the ancients and moderns is something that all students of French literature get bogged down in mm -hmm. when they get to the late 17th century. It's basically, was Louis the 14th, the continuer or, and uh, successor to the Roman emperors, 
or was he something totally new and far better and not in any way to be compared with the Roman emperors? And this played itself out on the medals, especially in the titulature. Uh, do you call him roi de France or roi français or something else? And they ended up calling him Rex Christianissimus, the most Christian king. No limitation geographic to his reign. And the important difference from the Romans was he was a Christian and the Roman emperors were not. The, the scholars in this period lost interest in the third century. So the Christian <laughs> emperors were not really Romans. With the death of Colbert came a new overseer, four new members, one of whom was a numismatist. And then two among the major writers of 17th century France, Jean Racine, famous for his tragedy plays, and Nicolas Boileau, uh, who was known as a, paid, as a poet and still studied as such. There was Pierre Rinson, who was numismatist, and Abbe Paul Talermont, whose only contribution was poetic love allegories, whatever they are. With few medals produced in the three decades since the founding of the Academy, the members of the Academy were confronted in 1693 by the publication of a book by an unauthorized outsider, a Jesuit named Menestrier, who published images of the medals that had been produced sporadically over the previous five decades, which he said formed a, a history of the reign. So this has nothing to do with the committee. It's really a challenge to get them working after 30 years of actually not producing anything. The Academy sprang into action and charged Racine to make a list of important events of the reign and Michel Mollard, engraver of the mint, to make new designs or copy them in cases where there had already been a medal. So the decision was made to strike a series of medals, all of them this, in the large 70 millimeter format, which the mint was capable of doing, but probably not in the kind of mass production that was envisaged. And Racine, again, whom we consider a playwright, was made the historian in charge of choosing the 400 events in the reign of St. Louis, uh, of Louis the 14th, that would be commemorated by medals. Uh, in 1695, the Academy was renamed the Académie Royale des Inscriptions, which means that their primary job was to create the inscriptions or what we call the legends that went on each medal. Also, they did inscriptions for uh, the large uh, carpets that lined the galleries. And there's a big fight over whether to do those in Latin or French. French won for those because they were to be seen by the public, not by scholarly people. Uh, the Academy still exists under the title Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres and publishes a lot of important works in history and other kinds of scholarship. Now, at some time, the royal supervisor who came to the committee and said, you have been working all of these years to design 70 millimeter medals. We're not going to make them 70 millimeters. We're making them 41 millimeters. Uh, the reason is unclear. There's no real documentation on where the idea for the switch came from. My suspicion is that the mint just couldn't deal 
with all of those 70 millimeter metals. It must have taken a lot of re-striking and annealing of the blank in order to bring up that kind of relief, as it does today, even in Metallic Art Company. Uh, it's not easy to strike a high relief 70 millimeters, much easier 41. Uh, so all of a sudden, all the designs they had come up with had to be redrawn at the smaller size. And while some events had been commemorated as they happened, most of the most of the 300 or 400 important events in the reign that Racine listed had never been celebrated in a medal. So they had to then go back and figure out what to say about them. Uh, more than 300 reverse designs were reviewed by the Academy of which 286 would be struck. Now, when you look in a sales catalog or any kind of catalog of these medals, they're all credited to Jean Mauge because he's the only signa artist signature that appears on them. He designed all the obverses. He designed them all in 1700 to show the eight stages of the life of Louis. And then each obverse would be matched with whatever event he would have looked like that for. But the reverses, with very rare exceptions, never got signed. There is no official record of the discussions of the Academy as to the creation of legends and scenes for the reverse. There is, however, an unofficial medal now in the British Museum, which carries a lot of preliminary sketches and revised sketches and information on who argued for which god to put on which medal. Uh, and this, for some reason, is in the British Museum, not somewhere in France. And it is written up and illustrated and discussed in this book by Joseph Jacquot, which is really, and some people might disappear, the only scholarly work that's ever appeared on the medals of Louis XIV. And uh, it just takes the notes of this that survived from the committee and explicates them, but it doesn't give an overall synthesis of the whole project. Okay, so uh, we're going to take one of the 284 medals and sort of look at how it evolved in this process. Uh, and we're looking at the medals for the victorious siege of the Catalan city of Tortosa in 1648. Now, this was a 56 millimeter medal that had been made at the time and signed by Breton, who was the die engraver or the designer. Sometimes those were two different jobs. Uh, so it's larger than what they had to end up with. Notice the obverse here. Uh, wait, let's go back. And you'll see, you'll see that all of these have the standard title Rex Christianissimus on them. The earlier ones have a more normal, uh, even medieval type of identification, Louis XIV by the grace of God, uh, King of France and Navarre. And then on the reverse, Der Toza Expugnata, uh, Certosa, uh, tort I'm sorry, t Tortosa uh, fought over or besieged, basically. So this was made in 56 millimeters. The piece we see now is a later restrike, but there were original struck. And then also at about the same time, 
that is contemporary more or less with the event, uh, another medalist, Molar, had made a larger medal that looked pretty much the same. We can see the two medals side by side. So these were ma all made before the academy got to work. This is sort of what they had to go on, that these, there were these medals out there for uh, the Siege of Tortosa. They were 56 millimeters and 71 millimeters, respectively. The, these medals, though, generally same iconography and inscription, uh, they differed in such features as the decoration of the prow of the ship, the rendering of the sea beneath the rock on which this woman who personifies the besieged city in classical art whenever a woman wears a turreted crown, a crown with turrets on it, she is symbolic of a city. Or it, we would call the taiki of a city. The obverse of these medals bore the profile portrait of the ruler. The reverse is the symbolic depiction of the subject of the medal. In this case, the representation of the besieged city in the person of a female figure with turreted crown. A circular legend in Latin describes the scene. In this case, a very brief phrase. And further information is put below the excerpt line again here, as in other examples, the year and the artist. Now, on the basis of these two earlier issues, the Academy produced a design for a 70 millimeter medal that simplified the prow of the ship and the rendering of the sea. The motion brought before the Academy to accept this sketch in 1694 contained the explanation of the depiction of the city as a turreted maiden as on ancient coins. So this is the design made when they were working to make all the metal 70 millimeters. In the face of the sudden necessity to redo the designs from 70 millimeters to 41, the Academy of the Mint designer, Sebastien Leclerc, draw a new sketch which followed the old sketch and the earlier struck metals in many respects. <clears throat> now, the members of the Academy were charged not only with creating and approving the designs for the reverses of 286 medals, they were expected to produce an elegant book setting the medals in their historical context. Small wonder that it took another seven years to achieve both goals. In the end, their book would be an official history of the reign and the only history of Louis XIV's reign published during his lifetime. The book, when it came out in 1702, was issued with the grandest of royal bindings with one medal per page facing a blank page. It accompanied a gift of a set of all the medals to in gold to the heads of other countries and the Pope and in bronze to important figures of the realm. It doesn't seem like silver was ever used for it. At the top of each page, an image of the medal in question was produced and below a description of the event it commemorated and then a description of this is the subject of the medal. One sees a woman seated holding an urn, etc., etc., etc. Interestingly enough, the illustrations in the book are all 70 millimeters. In other words, they had, while they were still thinking the metals would be 70 millimeters, they started commissioning the engraving of the engraved pieces. And you can see it's just a square plate that gets plunked into 
the, the printing uh, for each of the metals at 70 millimeters. And so here is the 70 millimeter engraving as it appears in the book. Can anyone tell what the major difference is? Well, it's, it's the aft rather than the prow of the ship, but what else? She's facing the other direction. So we have no real information as to why they made this change. Sometimes that book in the British Museum does say who argued what and how they decided certain things. But in this case, there's no information other than the fact that for the publication, uh, they made her facing the other way and showed the rear of the ship. The one's tempted to think that it's because it's engraved in reverse, it came out the other way, but they were smarter than that. The medal, as it was issued in 1702, had an obverse with the youngest bust of Louis by Moshe, and a reverse similar to the engraving in the book, with her facing left. The differences between the engraving and the struck medal, uh, there are a lot of differences in the details, mainly lack of certain details. Uh, and the rocks over here get simplified greatly. It's basically a simplification. And presumably, that's what they needed to do to shrink the die for the metal from the 70 millimeters of the engraving for the book to a 40 millimeter die. As the Academy took credit for the reverse images and inscriptions, the engravers for the dies of the reverse were not identified on the metal. This was a metal by committee. Now, this monumental work of the Academy uh, in the production of almost 400 uniform medals and the deluxe book was poorly received as many literary productions were in this period. Immediate complaints of the historical accuracy of the descriptions of battles, uh, problems with the Latin or artistic flaws led to the issue of a new edition 20 years later. And of course, the king was alive in 1702 when the book was issued in 17. 23, he was dead, he died in 1715. So they had more events to squeeze into the new second edition. In the 1723 ver version of the Medal of the Capture of Tortosa, the whole ship has been removed. perhaps in recognition of how crowded the image had begun in the process of going from 70 millimeters to 40. In the two centuries since the issues of the 1702 and the 1723 series of 41 millimeter medals, the dies and punches have remained at the French mint and have been used indiscriminately with obverses for the creation of restrikes with little attention to the series represented or the original pairings of obverse and reverse die. So you could, from the mint in the 20th century, get both of these versions. And when you start looking at versions at mints in collections, you realize that there's no real rhyme or reason to how uh, the mint at what period restruck the different versions. With French mint, we can tell the approximate period of restrikes for the 19th and 20th century, if not.
for the 17th and 18th. So it remains to somebody uh, to reconstruct this whole work and make a definitive catalog of which metals at, that are known today from originals and restrikes are from the 1702 series or from the 1723. And I'll leave you with that task. And I'll be glad to take questions if there's time. Is there time? Oh, yeah, 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 there, there is time. I, okay. I, I was just going to uh, motion for questions, but it, it's very interesting um, that, that you mentioned that because having looked at the ANS's collection of this material and noticed some discrepancies and some problems, I, I realized that we do need a definitive catalog of some sort. So I, uh, I, I do hope that somebody will take up that call. Well, we were, we were for many years waiting for Mark Jones to do it in his uh, right. volume on French metals, uh, volume three it would be, uh, French metals in the British Museum. But as some of you know, uh, Sir Mark is now the head of the British Museum trying to clean up a mess that was left by some predecessors. So I don't think he's gonna have time to do the book on the met metals of Louis the Fourteenth. Not anytime soon. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, some of the images uh, referred to uh, Michel Foujon, dated 1795. Can you just state that? 1795? I don't remember putting that in the image, but. Uh, well, can I get. I can't. It says Michel in 1795. Okay. Uh, can we get the presentation back on the computer. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. How does that come in? Uh, that's 1695. That's a typo. So that that's the design that was made for the 17, the book that was eventually published in 1702. Sorry for that. Leclerc is an artist? Yeah, he was the engraver who engraved the inserts for the book, the 1702 book. 1702 book. book that you mentioned in the British Museum that discusses some of the discussion behind um, the adoption of, of some of these designs, how detailed are the, um, the recording of these discussions? Some of it's pretty detailed. Now, we don't, uh, for all the work that went into that four-volume book by Shakyo, she didn't really transcribe everything that's in that book in the manuscript. But yeah, sometimes it says such and such a person argued that the city should be represented by a woman with a turret and someone else said, no, why don't we put Apollo coming down from the sky representing the French who are capturing the city. So yeah, we do get really lengthy uh, arguments from the various members of the committee in a, at some time, if I get to it, I would like to actually sort of figure out who is arguing from the mod modernist point of view and who's modern arguing from the ancient point of view as the two general perceptions, and also who knows their classical antiquity and who is just faking it, since most of the members of the committee were neither classicists nor numismatists. Um, is, is there any sense of the procedure of how this um, final adoption would take place? Yeah, there the actually vote? was a vote uh, okay. in the end. And when there were conflicting uh, proposals, they would look at the two proposals and have a vote on which one to use. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much. That was extremely interesting. 
Um, so I have a question about the, so Louis XIV is in, has a personal interest in the uh, ancient coins. He has his coin collection. And medallic production is massive in France at that time. So to what extent is the king interfering with the process? So you have Louvois, the principal minister at that time, who runs the process. He reports to the king. Do we have any evidence that the king had a view or expressed his desires or maybe unhappiness sometimes? Not that I've seen documented. I mean, one can infer that, yeah, he's very interested in this, and this will be his legacy. I mean, it's very interesting that this is the book that's going to carry on his legacy, and this set of medals is what's going to, and it is said, it is going to bring Versailles to the rest of the world. The glory of Versailles is in these medals, and will be appreciated by someone who receives the book and the series. But in terms, I would guess, because people like Louvois really didn't seem to have any background in this. And if Louis really did study the ancient coins that much, uh, perhaps he was the one who intervened. It may actually be that the change from 70 millimeters to 41 was his decision, I want to look like the Roman emperors on the Cistercii look, and you're making me look like it. I'm on modern medals. Um, just a quick question, do you have any idea how many of these sets were produced? I haven't been able to find, I mean, I've found a few people who got gold and a few people who got bronze, but there, there should be in the archives somewhere a register of what went out, but it hasn't been published. Do we know how many exist today? Of the original? See, that's the problem, because uh, until the 19th century, the French mint kept restriking without marking the edges of the restrikes. So it's only with the 19th century that we can say this is a restrike. So how many of the ones we could say are originals really are originals? That's the problem with all French medals. <clears throat> Does the set of the Vatican survive and can that be viewed today? I don't, I would seriously doubt it. Uh, Napoleon took everything of value from the coin cabinet of the Vatican, brought it back to France, probably melted down the gold. Uh, and in the end, for those of you who are interested in that part of numismatics, uh, the coins that were sent back to the Vatican after the defeat of Napoleon were not the one, same ones he seized. <laughs> It's more or less the same kinds. So you can't <clears throat> do any history from the Vatican collection. Any other questions? Alan, thank you again. No, thank you. Oh. Oh, oh sorry. We do have one online from Daniel Wolf. And Daniel Wolf was asking in uh, late 1600s France, was technology. Uh, what technology made it possible to strike rather than cast bronze metals over 40 millimeters? Well, that was mainly the screw press. Uh, and w one thing that happens right in this period is the division of the mint between the Monet de Medaille, which was on the left bank of the Seine, and the Monet de Monet, which was on the right bank. That is, there was a separate mint set up for striking metals, and the coins were struck on the other side of the river, and the personnel of the two moved apart at that point. But yeah, it was the screw press. But the screw press is not really good for mass production. Well, Alan, thank you again. Okay.